differential equation. And so hybrid systems combine the two. So over in this picture on the right, we see a little cartoon again. And there's green, and there's red, and there's yellow. Yellow is the region where the green and the red are overlapping. And in that region, either is possible. We could flow or we could jump, which may mean that the solutions to the system are unique. In fact, for this case, they wouldn't be unique. Is when you're in the yellow and not on the boundary, you, you're in the green, so you could change continuously, but you're also in the red, so you could make a jump. And so here, this might be the initial condition, and this might be some solution that flows, decides to jump there, jumps, flows, can't flow anymore, so it jumps. It might be that we have two jumps in a row, and then we flow, and then we decide to, to jump. The last, the last continuous line stops at the, the boundary that that's accidental, right? Doesn't make yeah, this, this, it, this, it didn't have to stop there, but it was able to stop there and jump because it reached the red. It was able to. Yeah, yeah. and so these are, right, these are enabling conditions. They're saying uh, a solution without giving the precise mathematical definition, this is um, as deep as I'll go into for the most part, is just anything that obeys these constraints, anything, any function that's consistent with these constraints. And so that means that the set C and D are enabling conditions. They enable flows and they enable jumps. In a discrete system, can't you just treat the, the continuous as just a, a thing which flows, but it has these small discrete changes, so you could actually treat everything as if it's an instantaneous change? Yeah, so if you wanted to approximate the solution of a differential equation by something discrete, right, you could, for example, um, have like the derivative be zero and have some timer that as soon as the timer elapsed, you made an instantaneous change that was small to capture a, a discrete approximation of a continuous function. Yeah. All right, so let me give you another example. The bouncing ball, so I alluded to this earlier, right? You've got a ball, drops on the floor, um, falling through towards the floor due to gravity. And we could talk about specifying the flow set and the jump set and understand what the trajectories of this system do. So here's a planar description. The state variables are the derivative of the height, so the velocity and the height. So the height is displayed vertically. The velocity is displayed horizontally. And this is the floor level right here. And so we change continuously anytime we're at the floor level or above. That's the set right here. Anytime the, um, the second state variable is, is uh, not negative, we can change continuously. And here's our rule for how we change. It's just the rule for falling through a constant gravitational field. When do we change instantaneously? We change instantaneously when we're at the floor and we're trying to go into the floor. When we're trying to go into the floor, we can't continue to flow, but we can jump. And what will happen is that the sign of the velocity changes. So the jump set is indicated in red. Mathematically, it's indicated right here. And this is capturing the fact, so this is that the new state is the negative of the original state, perhaps multiplied by a factor that maybe takes out some energy. So that as we drop the ball, it would rise to lower and lower levels before eventually settling on the floor level. And uh, you can think of it as just a scaling since the position is zero when the jump occurs and stays zero. That, that's consistent with that scaling. So the solutions come around here according to falling through the field due to gravity and then jump over here. And they actually, with this dissipation factor, tend towards the rest position by um, jumping into lower and lower en energy levels. In fact, these two circles here are kind of trying to indicate that the origin is a stable equilibrium point. If you start close to the origin, you stay close to the origin. Um, and you actually converge to the origin asymptotically. So the rest position for that hybrid dynamical system is, is asymptotically stable. And so here you characterize the sets where you can change continuously, where you can change instantaneously, and um, also rules for how you change continuously. Now, I didn't get much into the detail of what a solution was. Uh, I gave that working definition, which involved the picture. I will point out that um, since we're talking about combining continuous and discrete, it's natural 
to talk about combining the domains of a continuous time signal and a discrete time signal to talk about the domain of a solution to a hybrid dynamical system or a hybrid arc. And that's what, in fact, we do. We, uh, we think of the state as being both a function of the elapsed time and the number of jumps that have occurred. And we could plot a solution on its domain. These are solutions of the position of the ball in the bouncing ball system from different initial conditions. So if you drop the ball from this height, and it's actually not dropped, it looks like it's released with a positive velocity, it's going up and it's coming down. And let's see, so it comes down right here. This red time indicates the period of time where it was flowing. And then there's a jump. The position doesn't change, the velocity does. Then it flows again, so it goes up and it comes down. And then it goes up and it comes down. And its domain is all of these red lines. And uh, interestingly enough, this system actually exhibits what's called Zeno solutions, so that the amount of ordinary time that gets eaten up by the solution is actually finite. Um, the amount of time that you spend flowing is such that when you add those times together, you get a finite number. And the domains are different for the different initial conditions. So it's natural, actually, to think about these functions as being defined on spaces that are a combination of continuous and discrete. And there's one mathematical theorem that I'll tell you about, and I'll tell you about it mainly because it's such a workhorse for what comes later. This mathematical result really is, if you kind of extract out from differential equations, what's key to make everything work, make things work the way we use them for differential equations when we build nonlinear control systems. It's essentially this result, which we've extended to hybrid systems, which says that if you take a hybrid system and you look at a sequence of bounded solutions, that sequence has to have a subsequence that converges in some sense to another solution. So uh, this is very much related to robustness in the sense that you can also view this as looking at perturbed systems and getting systems under perturbations and comparing them to unperturbed um, solutions and having the property that all these perturbed solutions look close in some sense to an unperturbed one. Um, the convergence is in a graphical sense. So what that means is you can look at a set of points that corresponds to the combination of the domain and the image of the solution. Think of that as a set. And then just talk about how one set converges to, the, to another. And in this situation where we've got these different initial condition sequences, we're getting a different set of points and they tend to actually all be converging to zero altitude and no ordinary time and just jumping along that, that J axis. So without going into much more detail, I'll just say that that result is the key thing that enables us to extend all of those results that I mentioned for classical stability theory to hybrid systems. So it turns out that you can develop an invariance principle that allows you to weaken typical Lyapunov conditions that you might use to certify good behavior in control systems. You can prove robustness properties or you can establish linearization principles even for hybrid systems. You can establish that if things work for constant parameters, they're still going to work for parameters as long as they that, that vary as long as they don't vary too rapidly. You can talk about interconnecting hybrid systems and making statements about how they interact based on how they work independently. You can establish averaging theory, and so you can say, I can implement hybrid feedback again with pulse width modulation. It's, it's still going to work as long as the time scale separation is large enough, and the time scale separation comes from the continuous dynamics and how fast they are compared to the oscillations in the PWM. Similarly, fast actuator dynamics don't cause a problem as long as they're fast enough. And you can imagine that you could put all of these th things together in a, nice, in a nice package that would be a hybrid systems book that would parallel um, like a nonlinear systems book that people use to teach uh, first year graduate students. 
this particular book uh, would, would be different from the ones I alluded to earlier because the earlier books don't have these types of properties established. For now, this is a fictitious book, but we have submitted a book with these results to uh, Princeton Press, and hopefully that book will be published within a year or so. All right, so in the last 10 minutes, I wanted to talk a little bit about hybrid feedback. Okay? My motivation for understanding hybrid systems more deeply was to have more tools in my toolbox for developing control algorithms to solve challenging nonlinear problems. What does a hybrid feedback algorithm look like? Well, based on what I told you already, hybrid feedback systems are going to be feedback systems that contain states that sometimes change continuously and sometimes change instantaneously. The simplest situation would just be a control algorithm with logic variables that when they change continuously, they actually don't change at all. But when they jump, they jump to some value that's different from what they were before. In a hybrid feedback control algorithm, you're going to specify a feedback rule, something to apply to your dynamical system, that'll be both a function of the system you're trying to control and also the states of your hybrid control algorithm. And then there'll be some rules about how the state of your controller changes when it changes continuously and how it changes when it changes instantaneously. And in addition, there will be sets that you specify where you can change continuously and where you can jump. When you put all of that together with the original system that you are trying to control, which would be modeled by a differential equation with its state x, and this slot would have been the input, you get a hybrid dynamical system. You combine x and xc together, that's your new state, and everything has the form that I wrote down before. You've got this flow set, this jump set, and this flow map, and this jump map, the four um, objects that are needed to describe the evolution of a, of a hybrid system. And the goal here with your control synthesis would be to typically to asymptotically stabilize a point or maybe a set of points or some type of behavior that you want to emerge. So I'll give you uh, one application of this. It's, it's not a specific application, but it's a, a, a concept that was developed actually by um, one of my graduate students who just recently graduated, Chris Mayhew who was an undergraduate here at, at Riverside um, and graduated around 2005. And he developed this idea of hybrid feedback based on what he called synergistic potentials. And the idea in these systems is that um, you've got some variable z that would typically evolve on some manifold. So it could be that it's like evolving on a circle. So you're trying to position on a circle or maybe You've got some 3D orientation, which mathematically corresponds to SO3, um, which corresponds to 3 by 3 matrices with the determinant 1, where the transpose times the matrix is the identity. Or maybe something living on a torus. <coughs> All of these systems, if you're trying to achieve global asymptotic stability of some point, which might correspond to some pointing algorithm by feedback, um, you run into topological obstacles in terms of being able to do this with, with classical feedback. Actually, you might pause at this point and say, well, but can't people position satellites? And the answer is yes, they can. Typically what you do is you would maybe use some open loop maneuver where you kind of know where you are, you know where you want to be, and then you apply your open loop feedback to get you close, and then you maybe stabilize. Um, and in that situation, you don't have this indecision problem because you make a decision once and for all about which direction you're going to go. Um, and that's basically a different feedback idea and it's appropriate in some situations but you'd also like to be able to build algorithms that are more feedback oriented and that are robust to situations where maybe there are perturbations that come about due to maybe an adversary. So in this problem, the z variable is something we want to control, but we're actually only able to control acceleration. You can think of this function psi as making sure that the velocity vector for z lives in the tangent space for the manifold. And then we want to figure out how to pick u to make things work out. And well, Chris figured out that 